Hello, and welcome back to The Impactful Scholar. I'm your host, Dr. Javad T. Hashmi. I'm very excited today as I have in as a guest, not in studio, but uh, through the internet, Dr. Joshua Little of Oxford University. He's the guy who wrote the dissertation that made a huge splash on the internet about the marital age of Aisha. Now, as soon as I wrote an article in which I summarized the findings in his dissertation, really just the headliner, that uh, uh, the prophet's wife, Aisha, was not really married at six or nine years old. Uh, well, that made a huge splash on the internet. And the day that I published, Dr. Joshua Little decided to fly across the world to Australia, where he hails from, and then he disappeared somewhere in the remote jungles of Australia. Since then, I've had a hard time getting in contact with him to such an extent that some people think I made you up and created you out of thin air. So can you confirm that you are, in fact, a real person? I, I am. I am a real person. <laughs> well, Dr. Little, Josh, if you don't mind, I'll call you Josh. Um, can you tell me a little bit about uh, yourself, your, your background, uh, where you come from, that kind of thing? Sure. Um, I grew up in rural Australia, so that's where I'm from. Uh, I did my undergrad at Monash University, which is sort of near on the outskirts of Melbourne. Uh, I did a Bachelor of Arts majoring in history, majoring in religion and theology. I followed that up with an honors degree also at Monash. And initially I was focusing on like early Abbasid imperial patronage, you know, um, patronage of science, religion, religious scholarship, philo uh, philosophy, you know, the translation movement, that sort of thing. Um, and then I went to Oxford and I did an MPhil in Islamic studies and history. And then I did a PhD. So uh, you finished your PhD just recently and your advisor is, was? Well, my so my uh, thesis supervisor was Christopher Melcher and my college supervisor was uh, Nikolai Sinai. Okay, so you worked with two very big shots for those of you in the audience who are aware of Islamic studies. So sure. Christopher Melcher, uh, oh, so Nikolai Sinai, of course, huge in Quranic studies. Yep. Christopher Melcher, would you say maybe more Islamic history? And um, is he also specializing in Hadith or what is he his? He has three, uh, at least three specializations, I would say. One is early Islamic law. The second is early Islamic um, like uh, asceticism and mysticism, like early Sufism, Zuhud, this sort of thing. And then the third one I would say is Hadith. Fantastic. So, so you yourself yeah. got interested in Hadith studies. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but my impression is that there's all sorts of interest right now in Quranic studies. I think that's a booming field right now, whereas yeah. I don't see that same level of interest in Hadith studies at the current moment. Yep. Am I right about that, or what do you think? I think, yeah, no, I think you are right about that. I think that um, there are very few figures in the field, even just historically. Like right now, for example, I'm, I'm writing, I'm working on an article, an early so proto-Sunni hadith criticism, and I've just sort of canvassed all of the sort of modern literature on that question like the origins of, of proto-Sunni hadith criticism. When exactly did that method emerge? With whom? And so on. And, you know, it's, there are, you know, quite a few works, but it's only like 20 or something, right? It's actually like, and most of them don't go into any detail. It's actually like very manageable, right? Like, you know, on that particular topic, for example, you know, it's very easy to read all the relevant sort of, you know, works within the sort of modern secular academy. And I think that's, true across the board. There's actually not that many works. There aren't that many major figures in the field, if that makes sense. So, yeah, which I is, think that that's- Which is very different than Quranic things. studies. In yeah. Quranic studies, yeah. it's Already, just an ocean you know, of uh, yeah. <laughs> resources. And so you could just, it feels yeah. never ending, uh, to be honest. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, before we get, so would you agree that maybe Hadith studies has sat, stagnated recently? And is that one of the reasons yeah. why- I think that's right, you kind actually. Of, yeah. And so that's I feel not like why I really... did it. I got gotcha. you. I, I, 
I did hadith studies. I'll tell you why. I yeah. in my in my masters, I had to choose a thesis topic, and so uh, I was by that point I was, and we can. I assume we'll go into how I got into Islamic studies, how I got to this point in the first place. But at that point, I was very interested in the Quran and Hadith. And I had to choose one or the other, you know. So I was choosing between Melchert and Sinai. So, mm -hmm. you know, who <laughs> am I going to go with the, the people of Quran or the people of Hadith? <laughs> and so uh, I ended up going for Hadith because it was just... I really enjoy like categorizing stuff and um, uh, sort of collating information and getting diagrams. And Hadith is per perfect for that. Whereas the Quran is not as conducive to that. So that was one uh, 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 thing that pushed me towards Hadith. It's just that the kind of uh, way that you work with the data is just more appealing to me, just my personal sort of interests and preferences and the kind of thing that I enjoy doing. I also find it sort of infinitely versatile. Like there are so many different aspects in Hadith. That, like you can be doing, looking at biographical dictionaries. You can be making diagrams. You can be correlating Hadiths and people with regions. You can be doing translation work. You can be collecting data. You know, uh, uh, you know there's just so much. You see what I'm saying? Like there's there's, there's like a historical side. There's a translation side. There's a literary side. There's a textual critical side. And so it's just like a really rich resource. And so I just really enjoy working with it. So I was just more drawn. I'm sure there are many of these things to some degree you can do with the Quran, but it just Hadith in particular really appealed to me, given that sort of just how much you can sort of work with it, you know, in my opinion. Also, if you studied the Quran in the way that I would have been interested to, which is to look at the sort of subtexts and intertexts and all, whatever right there's sort of the original milieu and, and so on and so forth you need to lo know like 20 languages or something and um you know so it's it's a it's a huge investment and you really need to you know have like so many languages and and so hadith is more straightforward i find it more enjoyable i went for hadith instead so sorry well, Sinai, that's but, a you know. <laughs> well that's a great answer and uh for those of People who don't know, I've actually read your articles that you haven't published some of them, but um, I've been reading your work for like the last two years, I would say. And I just yeah. found your work to be absolutely excellent. And I knew that, okay, this guy is going to be an absolute star because you have a unique ability, we'll which is how you synthesize all of this scholarship and data, and then you present it in a digestible fashion to the reader. Mm -hmm. So I think you do an absolutely fantastic job of that. But we'll get into that shortly. Before we do that, uh, let's back up a little bit. Before you even get sure. into Islamic studies and Hadith, why Islamic studies? I always ask that when I see a white guy studying Islam. Like, what what is it in your... Like, for me, it's super simple. I grew up Muslim. I was interested in my faith. Uh, it's, you know, pretty cookie cutter. But I can't understand... Sure. Like, I can't imagine myself studying Buddhist studies Although I know plenty of people study other traditions, but for me, that's always a, a question mark in my head. Hey, why? Yes. Um, in my case, it's very straightforward. Um, when I was younger, I was a raging Islamophobe. So, you know, Whoa. Pretty, pretty okay. straightforward. Um, yeah. There, there's, I have an article for more detail on this. I have an article. I think it's the first article on my book. No, no, it's not the first. Time. But I have an article on my blog, islamicorigins.com, where I sort of go into more detail. But I'll just give a, a Cliff Notes Cliff Notes version here. So when I was younger, like a teenager, I became a new atheist. You know, you know what I mean by new atheist? The... Of course I do, yes. So for the audience, new atheists is a movement. So not all atheists yeah, yeah, yeah. are the same, but new yeah. atheists are kind of like, okay. quote unquote, militant atheists. It, sure, sure. The the Hitchens and the Dawkins and the Harrison and, yeah. and so on, that sort of movement. So I became a, a new atheist. Um, and the basic new atheist thesis is that um, religion is sort of, they're actually sort of hard to pin down, especially someone like Harris, they're very slippery. So it's, but here's the gist based on having been part of that movement, consuming that material and so on. This is the gist. Uh, the idea is that, uh, the primary cause of most of the world's suffering, war, inequality, uh, ignorance, uh, lack of scientific progress, whatever, and so on and so forth, 
uh, is religion. And so you have to basically exterminate religion in order to make the world a better place. That's the idea. Um, so I was, I was very drawn to that. And again, if you want to know a bit more about like the psychology and sort of the psychosocial profile, I think, of the kind of people who are really drawn to that sort of thing, read my blog article. Well, um, can you, and also, well, let's well, elaborate on that if you don't mind, because we're not pressed for time. So okay, what is that sure. profile? Yeah. Tell us about that. Profile. Yeah. I, I would say that it's linked to, uh, petty bourgeois resentment. So the idea is that if you look at, for example, terrorists, serial killers, fascists, and so on, they usually share a common sort of social profile. They're normally from middle-class backgrounds, but they've been thwarted in life, right? So they, they had aspirations of upward social uh, you know, mobility or ascension that have been thwarted. And so they're normally, you know, Maybe their businesses have been ruined. Maybe they didn't do well despite going to university, whatever, right? And so this then generates a lot of sort of deep festering resentment, which then makes people lash out and need a scapegoat. And so depending on the time period and depending on the sort of cultural context, this sort of burning resentment can sort of go in different directions. It can sort of incarnate through different ideologies or causes, but the underlying mechanism is pretty similar in all cases. And so my impression, and certainly this applied to me, is that now those are extreme cases. Well, the ones I mentioned, terrorism, fascists, those are the very extreme cases of this. But the same basic mechanism, I think, is at play with a with a lot of a lot of movements. So I think that New atheism substantially was like this uh, sort of middle class um, sort of lashing out. Um, and so, uh, you know, just to just to sort of illustrate that, I mean, look at the way that the movement actually manifests, right? How is it actually functioning? What do, what do new atheists do? They're not actually like creating a, a you know, like a powerful social movement you know, like massive protests, marching and so on. The way it actually manifests most of the time is like making YouTube videos mocking scripture or something, right? It, it, it's like a, it functions very well to sort of facilitate that sort of resentment and lashing out without actually putting any skin in the game or, or actually, you know, uh, uh, having any sort of real world impact. So I think that it's sort of a perfect vehicle for that sort of you know, petty bourgeois resentment. Now, were you an active Islamophobe when you went into Islamic studies or did oh, you yes. move away? Okay, you did. Interesting. I didn't know that. So this is when you I, when started I, your master's. I, oh, no, 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 no. That, that was, okay. So the chronology is I became a new atheist and also an Islamophobe when I was a teenager. Um, then I, and I was engaging in the polemics and the debates and all that sort of stuff stuff you know and so then uh in order to win debates i was reading academic sources i started to read like proper books and stuff articles and so on. started to write almost like university level essays when i was in high school right so i was sort of like gaining sort of an academic you know information through pure spite if that makes sense and so mm -hmm. uh so then when it came time to go to university, I just continued straight on. And I just made my university studies uh, a, a sort of an extension of that interest, right? So I took all the, you know, Islamic and modern Middle Eastern and so on uh, um, classes or courses in my undergrad. And then, and then at the end of the undergrad, things began to fall apart. For me, it was learning about Western learning about Western imperialism. That where well, that's mm. when the wheels fell off the the the, the bike. Because um, again, the Islamophobia was very tied into Western cultural chauvinism. You know, we are the children of the Enlightenment, right? Science and reason, right? The civilization. You know, you, you all know the buzzwords. Um, and so it was very linked. Right. To, you know, you're defending glorious Western civilization against 
you know, the Muslim hordes, right? And so uh, once I took some classes on uh, American history and Israeli history and these sorts of things, it really began to uh, break down the sort of simplistic worldview that I had. And it, it sort of like put a question mark on everything. Do you see what I'm saying? It was like the first big crack. Oh, the cracks started to appear. I, I, all right. I, so at that point, I was now open to criticism. And so when I met someone who had a, a different view, a materialist conception of religion, religious history, and so on, you know, they, they absolutely obliterated my sort of new atheist, idealist kind of conception. And, um, you know, so my... So before you... And before you... Before, go on. Sorry, before you go any further, I think it's worthwhile to clarify this point because basically what you're saying is, so there was Sam Harris on the one hand in the New Atheist, but Sam Harris, I think, is the perfect example of this, where sure. he, you know, continuously says ideas matter. And for him, it's yeah. all about supposedly what he takes of scripture. Now, he's extremely selective and half quoting, misquoting, but for him, sure. it's ideas that matter and ideas are bad ideas. And by that, he means Islam is the mother load of bad ideas. That's sure. what explains the violence that's going on right now. These crazy, right. violent Islamic extremists who are really just the good Muslims. They're the ones who are following the text and the ideas to their ultimate conclusion. And mm -hmm. they're what's to blame for what's going on right now. And we are the reluctant, rational, scientific West who has to respond to this. And we do so reluctantly, very grudgingly. Yes. Uh, yeah. So we have to bomb them back into rationality as, um, of course. The, you know, this is the myth of, so there's a great book that I recommend, The Myth of Religious Violence by William Cavanaugh, in which he talks about the, the myth of religious violence, which is exactly this. Yeah. Um, and, and, yeah. and that side can acknowledge and say, so Sam Harris can say that, yeah, the Bible is full of violence too. But the idea is that we have moved past that because we're the enlightened West, whereas mm -hmm. they have not. And they, so it's ultimately... I think it is ultimately designed to prop up Western civilization, white Western civilization, the construct of Judeo-Christian civilization against the brown hordes that are the Muslims, the dirty Muslims. Um, so now so now on the one hand, you have Sam Harris, who's all about ideas matter, and he has this very simplistic conception of that. And now here you are going from that to talking about material causes. By material causes, it's the idea that's people go to war, they defend their countries, they fight other countries. They do these things often not for pure ideology, but for materialist reasons. Correct? It's, is that, it's, am I right it, about that? Sure, but it's more than that though. It's like the idea is like, what explains why a certain idea or interpretation of an mm. idea or interpretation of a text moves to fixation at a given time and in a given place? Excellent. Right? Yeah. That That's the idea. So why is, is it like, yeah. Go Why is it, for example, that ISIS's ideology at a certain particular point in time yes. takes fire? What are the right, conditions like... on the ground that create the the receptiveness for that? Similarly, in Afghanistan, what exactly. is what are the material conditions? And those material conditions are caused often by Western neo imperial Absolutely. interventions. Yep. And I think yep. so. That's yep. kind of what you started to realize. Is that correct? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. I mean, there are just mm -hmm. there are just so many examples of this in Islamic history, and not just Islamic history. I mean, if you just look at things like um, when there's a crisis, then suddenly interpretations of Islam that say you should rebel against the ruler move to fixation, and then once a faction wins, sub quiet is back, right? And this happens over and over and over. If it was just about ideas, why would this happen, right? Or another example. Why is it that like these these sort of similar movements, you know, the the Wahhabis, for example, the Murabitun, the Muwahidun, they all come out of a similar environment, right? This sort of like uh, um, uh, Arab, you know, highly sort of nomadic, you know, hinterland areas, right? And they all have these ideologies that justify them attacking, conquering, and enslaving their fellow enslaving their fellow Muslims. Right. It's like the same kind of people in the same kind of situation with a similar kind of dynamic over and over. Right. 
So, you know, I mean, you know, Ibn Khaldun, for example, noticed a similar kind of pattern, right? You know, it's, it's a time and time again, you can find that what is, what can explain why certain ideas and interpretations will obtain, generally speaking, at a given time in a given place, is a re reflection of the interests and needs of the adherents or the people who adopt those those now, beliefs. Now, to right? push back now. So this, is, and this, is, a, this from, is ubiquitous. I go on. Yeah. So, so l allow me to push back or play devil's sure. advocate literally. Um, yeah. Now, I don't agree with this at all. But what they will sure. respond with, the new atheist or the Islamophobe, mm -hmm. will be that, yes, there are certain conditions on the ground that need to be in place for this one true Islam to come and manifest in its fullness. But the problem mm -hmm. is that this one true Islam exists and that it can reemerge if the conditions are right. So this is the kind of concept, the idea that they have. Now, what I would push back on, and this is my view on this, is sure. that this is not just the case for Islam, obviously. We talked about um, in Christianity and Judaism. And Judaism is a great example. So um, in yeah. Jewish history, there in, in very early times, there was this idea of violent rebellions. And then those were crushed mercilessly. And after that, it was determined, oh, well, this is kind of foolhardy. And so then you all of a sudden have quietist interpretations of Judaism for the bulk mm -hmm. of like med medieval history. And then all of a sudden, when the conditions change in modernity, and it's really with a secular ideology, which is Zionism, suddenly yes. some of the more violent interpretations come back to the fore. So uh, it, it's not only the case with Islam, it's the case with all religions that there is the, uh, always a internal diversity of beliefs, a multiplicity of viewpoints. And those viewpoints can manifest themselves based on different conditions. Um, and that's just the nature of religion in general. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, to put it, to put it more acutely, let's just say that Judaism began violent and Islam began violent. Let's just posit that, right? That the first layer is a, like a violent, you know, expansionist, whatever. Let's just grant that that's in the scripture. Let's just grant it for the sake of argument. I know that goes against you. Although, although I, I agree. I, I agree, really agree with you. Agree but with let's that, just, but let's yeah, just say okay. it for the sake of argument, yeah, yeah. right? Let's just say okay, it for the sake for, of argument. Sure. Right? And, then, and then Christianity began as pacifism, peace, whatever. And we say, let's just say Buddhism is the same as that as well. When we look at the history of these sort of societies and the members of these, these religions and so on, is there is there any relationship at all between that starting point and how they actually sort of instantiate mm. over time. I mean, there's none. There's no difference between a Buddhist ruling class and a Christian ruling class and a Muslim ruling class. They conquer the same. They enslave the same. They rape the same. They hate the same. There's no difference, right? The only difference is like the is like the the you know, do you, do you say, you know, Allahu Akbar or do you say something else, right? But th these are aesthetic, right? It's like very minimal. The basic dynamics end up being the same, right? There just doesn't seem to be Now any, they're going to say, now they're going to say, well, they're... then the problem is religion. We need to get rid of religion. Well, point is that is will that... get rid of violence, right? Yeah, but Once if you, you get, get rid, rid of religion, religion the violence will go away, right? You get the same thing without it, right? You get like, look at, right. you know, in as, as secularism has arisen, and the priorities have have you know shifted. You know, th th there's you know massive wars continue, mass violence continues, right? So there's just it just, just seems the, you know irrelevant. It's the rationalizations. Almost, right? It's the, it's the yeah, rationalizations that, that's, that change basically. Yeah, I'm not saying that religious people don't sincerely believe in what they profess. Right. I'm not saying that at all. The point is just that what they believe, what they're drawn to, what's going to make sense to them is ultimately going to be in general as a general tendency in the society determined by these underlying factors. And so the, the, the underlying factors are what matter. So for example, if you want to stop violence in the world, it just seems ludicrous to go after religion as opposed to the underlying factors that are selecting for this with or without religion, right? The child marriage is a good example. There's that report that um, I cite again in my, in my uh, article, resources on Islamophobia article. It just says straight, straight up, there's no correlation between any particular religion and child marriage, going after religion is not an effective strategy. Now, working with religious leaders is good because they have social influence, right, in communities. But going after religion per se 
is not an effective strategy, right? This is just an right. example number, you know, one trillion, right? So, yeah. So based on all these kinds of, you know, this this kind of understanding and realization, and by the more you look into Islamic history, the clearer and probably any any history, the clearer and clearer this becomes, right? I mean, you know, the the uh, uh, on the traditional interpretation, right? The, the the hadith especially, and certainly the, you know, a lot of the fiqh are extremely anti gay right anti you know death penalty for sodomites whatever right you you, you can find this in the hadith and the fiqh and so on it, it but islamic history is just exploding with homoeroticism and you know uh uh you know gay caliphs and poets and poetry and elites and scholars and it's like ubiquitous right there are sex manuals giving advice to guys on how to have sex with men and it's just endless right it's like you know from the abbasids to the ottomans right it's totally ubiquitous uh, uh the modern situation is really an aberration right sort of all this criminalization and so on so i mean you can just duplicate examples examples like this endlessly right so you know the this sort of ideal is view that there's an original true fixed version of the religion and it's inherently this way and and that'll just you know drive people throughout history to constantly do the bad thing. This just doesn't hold up. Instead, you know, there may be some fact. To the I mean, I, I do think there is a fact of the matter about what any given author originally intended for any given text. But that's not what determines how it's interpreted and how it's implemented over history. It clearly instead what it correlates with over and over consistently are things like material conditions, political needs, social needs, economic needs, and so on, your physical environment, for example. Um, so, uh, you know, if you want to stop those behaviors, then it just makes sense that the thing you should focus on, in my opinion, is yeah. the material factors. So, yeah, anyway, uh, we've, we've maybe we've beat this horse to death by now, but yeah. No, I think this is fantastic. I, I would just add that I don't. I think you could go in a very like postmodernist direction and say, and honestly, hermeneutics has gone in that direction. Some literary trends where texts don't matter and it's just the reader who imports everything into the text. I don't go and and into the religion. I don't go to that extreme. I I like you think that believers genuinely believe what they express and uh, act upon. Um, it's just that naturally there's going to be differences of opinion and. That's even the case if you look at how Americans interpret the Constitution, which has a kind of quasi-religious nature, sacred nature to it. There are people who take a very literalist interpretation, and there are other who go in the spirit of the text, uh, the intentionalist, you know, versus the literalist approach. Um, so uh, I think that's just the very nature of it. So saying that the, the, there's different a simple mechanism different viewpoint. Yeah, there's a simple mechanism here. You have a nominal allegiance or text or tradition, right? So that's sort of fixed. But society and the conditions of society and the circumstances that people are in are constantly changing. So right. to maintain that the two, yeah. yes, yeah, so you have to constantly go constant reinterpretation. Um, right. So, you know, and that, by the way, and that's is this, there's a similar mechanism here for how, for example, hadith get fabricated, why mm. religious traditions often are full of fabrication. There's actually a similar thing where you're, and, you know, or this relates to that in that in the early period, you don't yet have a canon. You don't yet have systematic scholarship. So you can actually just create things. Whereas once things get fixed, now the game is to reinterpret constantly rather than to create new material, if that makes sense. So there's sort of a link you know, which is okay. sort of foreshadowing to, to what we probably will talk about subsequently. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think we'll end part one once we finish up your kind of life story and ed educational path. Sure, sure. Um, so, so now you you're starting to move away. You move away from kind of that Islamophobic, new atheist mindset. Now, was this a gradual process or was it kind of like a... No, very you know, rapid. It was almost very in the rapid space of a single... Oh, wow, fantastic. I would say there was a hmm. single key discussion where it suddenly became hmm. clear to me. And I realized, right, if... if so um, did this person if, if, who spoke to you... First, on. Was, this, yeah. was this person Muslim or... No, atheist. Um, okay, atheist. And um, did they... What advice would you have, like, if, if you have someone that you're talking to that's a new atheist? Because something clicked in you 
were they very harsh with you? Did they kind of smash you to the pieces? Or was it they talked to you gently and explained things? How, how was that? No, no, they, they smashed me to pieces. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that well, that's big work. of you that, 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 yeah, I don't think it normally works. It's, it's big of you that that actually switched something in your mind. Yeah, there, but, you know, uh, there, but for the grace of God, go I. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't fully understand why I was receptive. I, again, I, I can only speculate that my worldview in general was had fractured a bit from learning about the history of Western imperialism. And you were also uh, very so, young. You were in your college age, and that's the time that people explore different ideas. <sighs> I mean, I know that Maybe. I went through my fundamentalist phase in the in my twenties, I would say though that my my de fundamental my I don't want to say radicalization because I was never radical, but I was sure. more on the fundamentalist side. Um, but my conversion back to sanity was a very gradual process. It took another mm -hmm. almost half decade or more for that to happen. Right. Um, there were certain key moments, I would say, but it was a gradual process. Okay, so let's uh, wrap up a little bit so that we can sure. finish part one. So. You're now moving away from, so you moved away from that perspective. Then what made you yeah. think that I'm going to study the Hadith of the marital age of Aisha? Ah, okay. Yes. Uh, so by that point, I, I then, um, you know, did my, my honors degree. And then um, uh, a friend of mine, Ian David Morris, said, you should apply for the MPhil in Islamic Studies and History at Oxford. And so I did, got in, and then I had to choose a specialization. And so I think it was inevitable that I was going to study the Aisha Hadith. Because when I was an Islamophobe, the Aisha Hadith is the number one weapon. It is, mm. I think, by far the most effective weapon that Islamophobes have to sort of browbeat and harass and humiliate Muslims, by far. It causes the most distress. You know, it's it's the easiest thing you can just throw out there as like a like a little bomb. You know what I mean? Like it's just, you know, and it, and, and it's used ubiquitously in that way. I think I think it's the most controversial hadith. That's my opinion. I think and, you're I think you're right. I mean, I think it's even one of the major reasons many Muslims leave the faith because of yeah, this Islamophobic yeah. attack. That yes, yes, your your prophet is a pedophile. That's it. That's the entire argument yeah, yeah. done. And um, Yasser Qadi think, mentions this. This is yeah. his example, his go-to example in a lecture that he gave talking about the, the Shubuhat, you know, that, that young Muslims are dealing with. This is the, the example the, that he gave. So, so just for our audience, doubts. Shubuhat doubts, right? Oh, yeah. oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, so I was, you know, very uh, familiar with it because it was the, sort of the number one weapon it was the go-to right so i had actually already sort of started cutting material on it as in collecting versions now back then when i was an islamophobe i didn't i only had access to english material right so this was a very limited collation based on what was available in english um but even then i still had some material already collected different isnads uh, chains of transmission and, and and so on right um collecting some statements of scholars notable scholars and so on and so you know i had already thought about this hadith a lot i had used it a lot in that polemical capacity and i had already started collecting material on it if that makes sense so then you know afterwards after i sort of repudiated islamophobia and i then sort of finished my at monash i went to oxford when it came time to choose, you know, something to, to research, it just seemed right to go back that previously in a sort of polemical or political context and to re-examine it academically. Like, let's let's go back and re-explore that. What is the transmission history of this? Is it actually how far can we, if we apply sort of a you know certain kinds of isnad methodology to it or you know, isnad kumatan analysis i guess we'll probably get to that in a little bit uh what what happens what actually you know can we say about the history of this hadith and so yeah it was it was sort of inevitable i think as a western scholar 
do you really think that there is, even if Aisha ended up being nine years old, um, mm. I feel like there is some justification that uh, I know some, you know, traditionalists, including in the academy, who say, well, the prophet still wouldn't have been a pedophile, right? I mean, so it's not necessary from an academic perspective or somebody who's aware of, who's not a new atheist, let me put it that way, um, to say that it's not historically true. Well, I wonder if that term picks out something very specific medically, psychologically. So I don't know how to parse those subtle distinctions, but um, uh, the usual, I mean, I if, if it were true, if it were true that Muhammad married Aisha, consummated the marriage with her when she was nine, I would personally find that distasteful, for example. Mm -hmm. If she was a child in the substantive sort of psychological and physical senses, right? Um, so I, you know, I don't have any problem with people looking at scripture, looking at traditions and finding it distasteful or, or being grossed out by it or, or, or vehemently disagreeing with it. You know, that's got no problem with that at all. Um, it's just a question of, well, what do Muslims actually believe about it? And what effect does this have? And that's where, for me, the debate is. Because as it turns out, as I discovered, and well, as I already knew just from all my Islamophobic activism, very, very common Muslim, there are two common Muslim responses on this. Number one is just to deny the Hadith. Right? That's actually pretty common. People just reject the Hadith. Uh, number two is to say that, okay, yes, Aisha, her age was nine, but physically, biologically, you know, developmentally, she was actually, you know, an adult developed, physically developed, and so on. And then people will appeal to the weather or the climate or some something, some pseudoscience, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, so, and actually, that's a classical interpretation, not the weather thing. But um, if you look at the uh, sort of the, the fiqh tradition, the, the, um, the, the legal tradition, uh, and you look at how this hadith is being cited, I found a lot of scholars who basically just say Aisha was, you know, she was pubescent. She had physically developed at the time of her cons marital consummation. So that's actually a classical. It's not the only, there are others, right? Al-Bukhari, for example, a Shafi'i for another example. There are some who think that she was prepubescent. But the more dominant view that I found across the classical sources is that she's actually physically mature. So they don't think it was child would it, in a substantive sense. And wouldn't, so I got two questions based on that. Number one is, sure. could, couldn't we even say that the person or the group that fabricated this hadith had that in mind themselves? Because why else would you say six years old and then nine years old? So there was we'll already come this to that built at the end. I, I see. Okay. Because from my understanding, this is that a, would entail yeah. that the person was saying that she was engaged at six and she was the marriage was consummated at nine precisely because that was the moment that she became that marriageable age. This, this which is how linked. it isn't. It isn't right. Right. So that's that's my first point, and then the second point, and maybe we can get into that uh, in our part two of mm -hmm. this. Um, but the the second point that I had was, okay, so you've now outlined the two most common Muslim responses. Now, can you mm -hmm. explain what the what move the Islamophobe or the wily Islamophobe makes. And, and kind of, in my mind, and I think you've worded this yourself as well, that they kind of do theology for Muslims. And I think this is the... Oh, and yes. I'm, and, I, and I know this move because I was a master of this move. Because in my yeah. fundamentalist days, now I was never an atheist, but I was very much an anti-Shia bigot. And... So right. I know this move very well. This is the move that all bigots use. All you do yeah. is you go hunt into the text, you find the worst, dirtiest, bad thing that you can find in the text, and then you do your own theology and then insist that the believers nowadays have to understand and implement the text in the way that you see fit based on a narrative and methodology that you construct that those people don't do themselves. And I know that Sunni bigots against Shiism do that with Shia texts. And so I, that's why I recognize that when I started interacting with Islamophobes. And that's why I actually think I benefited in a crass way from my fundamentalist bigoted days because I knew the playbook. And that's why I think yeah. you also benefit from 
your background. Now we can regret our back. I very much regret my background. Um, it's not something that sure. I lightly talk about. It's something that I have some sure. deep remorse about because you hurt people's um, sure. deepest held convictions. And um, it's, it's qu quite frankly, bigotry. But nonetheless, yeah. this background has allowed me to see those moves when my yeah. opponent makes them. And then I can stop it and correct it. So can you highlight that? Because I think you do highlight that very well in your blog post. And I think once you do that, I think that we'll wrap up part one and sure put it out. There are two. There are two things that that you might be referring to here. So the first thing is that um, what they want to say is even if the hadith was fabricated, Muslims think that the hadith is authentic, and so that will then motivate them to support or engage in child marriage and so on. But of course, it's not just the acceptance, but the interpretation that's going to be relevant there. And as we just established, Muslims generally you know, um, I mean, I mean, they're very frequently interpreted as Aisha was not actually a child, right? So now, what? So what the what the Islamophobes are going to want to say is that you should interpret it that you know she was a child, for example. Uh, so even if the Islamophobe rejects the Hadith as as fabricated, they're still going to want to say, usually, typically, that you actually should accept this Hadith and you should actually you know, think that this is a good thing, that she was actually a child and she was married as a child and so on and so forth. So they're trying to actually push the, uh, you know, their Muslim interlocutor into holding a more extreme, so to speak, position. And that's like, you know, ubiquitous. I mean, this is just the same thing. General does this, like the way that you're only a true Christian if you're like a, like a flaming creationist, you know, and if you're not, then you're not a true Christian. You know, even though this is a creation, this sort of modern creation is like very, very recent phenomenon, you know, or, you know, you should reject evolution, never mind that most major Christian denominations accept evolution, you know, and it's, it's, just, it's just exactly the same thing, right? So this is like a very common that you, you, you know, you, you take a, some sort of least charitable, least flattering interpretation, that's now the true version, and you have to you have to adhere to that, otherwise you're not a you know a true member of your religion, for example. So that's a very common uh, um, strategy. And maybe you also want me to add in this regard. It's interesting with Islamophobes, and I have observed this over and over. Right, I have observed this many times. They will um, criticize Muhammad and Islam based on this hadith, and then. And the Muslim, and remember what they want to say, the lie, the pretext is, look at this bad hadith, this is going to cause child marriage. Again, as we already mentioned above, child marriage doesn't correlate with any particular religion, even with it's more cultural. implementation. It's, it's yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say so much cultural as material. It's, I think it's got to do with more like economics, development, what I mean things to, like that. But, right, correct. What, sure, I, it, what I mean is, yeah. I don't mean to... I don't mean to say it's one culture, but rather it's contextual. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the very local yeah, yeah. geographical area, certain material conditions obtain, which yeah. allow for this to exist. And right. that means that ultimately this is a very, this is where I see the bigotry. Because child marriage, it, this is the old critique that the European imperialists came with when they conquered the new world, that these people look at them engaging in child sacrifice, these backward savages. That's really what this amounts to. Now, look. I do think that we need to fight child marriage, that we need to, but the way to do that is not to go bash people and attack their culture and their religion, but rather it's to understand the material conditions and address those. And, and yes, yeah, then talk exactly. to local leaders and, and connect with them. This is if you actually gave a damn about this, you know, child marriage, but these people exactly. don't really give a damn. That's the key. That's the key is that the way people act is inconsistent with sincerely wanting to solve the issue. Because what happens right. so often, I've seen this countless times, is that when a Muslim says, okay, I reject this hadith, is the response like, excellent. You, now I've- No, I've, it's, you I've, can't I've, do that. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's like, ha, 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 you can't do that. You should believe. It's like, wait a minute. It's, yeah. like, it's like glee and, and, and right. ridicule. And, and, and so it's like, like, this is the of someone who's trying to prevent child marriage. Like, you know, it's obviously and I would, a lie. I would even say- I would even say if a news report came out that a certain tribe in a certain North African country or South Asian country um, just did a mass child marriage ceremony and they were Muslim, they would react with glee, not with heartache, not with, 
oh no, look at this. This is internally they would be very happy that they can now weaponize this Absolutely. and use this against. So they're they're Absolutely. very much not sincere. And uh, so that's no, definitely I think that's exactly right. I think. But but this is yeah. this is across the board. It's the same thing as like right. Islamophobes will always say they care so much about Muslim women, poor oppressed Muslim right. women. Who gets attacked the most by Islamophobes? Like on the bus, on the train. It's Muslim mm -hmm. women. It's like, wait, aren't these the people that right. you're trying to save? And it's like, and they get the most venom. It's just ridiculous. So it's you know, I mean, it's transparent. Again, this is this goes back to my thesis: the form of lashing out. This is exactly what well, you would expect to see. You know, just well, empirically, Josh, if that thesis was we're, true. Yeah, sorry. we're reaching the one hour mark, so I do want to close this okay. uh, part. I'll, I'll, I will give you the last word, sure. but before I do, um, I did want to make one comment for those of the people who are listening to this. I do feel that the word we've used the word Islamophobe and Islamophobia a lot. I do feel that um, that word it sometimes it does stifle discussion and dialogue and debate, um, and there is this kind of reticence now or resistance to the use of that term. So for example, in my debate with Robert Spencer, I made sure that I didn't use the word Islamophobe or Islamophobia with him because I wanted to make sure that people know that I can engage in a substantive debate on him, on ah. the, material, the, the subject matter, yeah. and not let yeah, yeah, them yeah. just say, oh, these people just call everything Islamophobia. Now, to be clear, right. I do believe that Islamophobia exists and he is an Islamophobe. I do believe that, but I didn't want yeah. it to be reduced to just name calling and just heavy handed oh, labeling course. without actually, because sure. what because what converted you ultimately away from that was not you being called an Islamophobe, was not you being called no. a bigot, but rather... <laughs> no, no. It was substantive yeah. argumentation that Absolutely, was rigorous of and well-grounded, right? So I do want to make that clear for the audience. So, this is what we've been... Uh, Absolutely. And, yeah. and look at what we've pointed to. We've, we've been giving example after example of how the thesis, the basic idea is wrong, right? So it's not... Right. You know, th there should be clear. We're giving like we're giving actual examples here. It's not merely like we're just casting out the word and then that's it. You know, see more on this. I have my blog article. You know, blog islamicorigins.com. The very first article resources on, resources on Islamophobia, and I just have a huge array of studies and quotes from leading experts and so on, just absolutely decimating the sort of common sort of Islamophobic claims. Showing that they're wrong. So yeah, that's you know there isn't just a I, name calling here or anything like that. And having read your writing for a long time, I could tell you, give you the honor of being called what Norman Finkelstein called a forensic scholar. That is that you are okay. really, and I tr <laughs> I try to be a forensic scholar in the sense of you're really able to deconstruct. Um, what someone has written and really show the holes in it. And I think you do a wonderful job of that and then synthesizing that um, for a general audience and explaining to them, like, what are the flaws in this kind of thinking? Mm -hmm. Even in the short time that I've been active, I know of people who were on that Islamophobic side who have shifted. And I think in large part, or in, at least in part, by the work that I've done, um, pushing back against these Islamophobic nar narratives. So I do think that it's not a hopeless thing. And that's where some people tell me, so I, I've gotten some pushback that why is, so, you know, I, I'm now the research director for MPAC and one of the pushbacks I've gone is why is, why are you talking about the age, marital age of Aisha? What relevance is that? I'm like, what planet do you live on? This is the most common attack point against Islam. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's something you absolutely need to deal with. And then the other thing is, the other pushback that I get is, there's no point in talking to these people, that they're hopeless. And in this sense, I think I'm actually more charitable to the Islamophobes in the sense that I actually genuinely do believe that I can almost deconvert them. Like I'm going to be dialoguing ah, with Haris Sultan. I'm going to be luck. dialoguing with... <laughs> well, I I'm much more pessimistic than you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very naive. I think, I think I can at least change some of them. And I, I hope and pray that I do. Um, I'm not looking right. to convert them to Islam or anything, but I do think sure. that reasonable people can move on the spectrum just like you and I have. Uh, let's call it a day for uh, part one. And uh, sure. we'll come join back for part two, in which we'll get yep. into the actual meat and potatoes that is your dissertation. The meat and potatoes. <laughs> Sounds good? Okay, thank you. Perfect. All right, thank you so much for joining us on The Impactful Scholar, and we'll see you next time as we go into Dr. Little's splash of a dissertation.
Does that, does that work? No, splash is fantastic dissertation that caused a splash. So thank you very much. Here we See go. Next time. Yeah, yeah.